Well, we are going on into our next section. We're in the broader section, uh, this idea of a God you can trust. And this is really that dance that God is having, Yahweh is having, with how to help Israel sort of recover from the exile in which they find themselves. So just backing up a few things. These sections, again, are probably written in or around uh, Israel's exile through Babylon and then um, off into there. So all that being said, one of the biggest things that has to happen is really the establishment of God's power over all the other gods. Most of what we're going to deal with tonight is really just cycling on that theme. Um, but there's kind of a cool, somewhat philosophical thing that's going to happen tonight. So if you haven't had your coffee yet, you're going to want to do it now because uh, you're going to want to be awake for this one. So, because it's going to put you to sleep is what I'm saying if you're not ready for it. So if you had a long day at work, you might just want to go ahead, grab a blanket, little little neck pillow, and just do it now. Don't, don't like act like you're going to be listening the whole time and then nod off. So, no, I'm joking. Uh, a little joking. Okay. What I want to do is I want to start with Isaiah. Uh, we've already done this. So here we are in this idea of Isaiah chapter 1, or chapter 41, 41 through 44. Now, what we're going to see, and this again, I'll reinforce this uh, for those who weren't able to make it last week. But one of the things that we've done is we're sort of drifting away from the specific dates. So we won't have as many as, you know, okay, this date happened at this, and here's the day it happened, and here's what that temple looked like. We're, we're really moving into a much more... What's the word? I guess a fluid timeline would be the best way to say it. Uh, what we do know is these are probably written after the fall of Jerusalem. Maybe they were given before that, but somewhere in that. But these are definitely addressed, although they were probably given before Jerusalem fell and the exiles were taken, they are written to the exiles later. So it's kind of like when you were, maybe some of you who grew up in church and you, were, you went to junior high camp, and they had you write that letter to your future self. Anyone ever have to do that, right? The old junior high camp. And then they gave it to you when you graduated high school. And you're like, dear diary, today was the worst day ever. Like that type of thing, right? But you wrote it to your future self. I just know that you're going to be a scientist and like you're working at Bebo's. And life can get a little tough sometimes, but, but that's where we find ourselves. Um, this is a little bit like that. He's writing in. Now, why this matters, as I'll set it up later... I'll set it up later. Okay, all right. So with that being said, let's go ahead. So last week we talked about chapter 40 and we dealt with those materials there and we ended with, you know, the mount up on wings of eagles and all that kind of stuff. Let's jump immediately into Isaiah chapter 41. What is going to happen in Isaiah chapter 41 is there is a mention of the one from the east. And what we now know is that we are dealing with someone whose name doesn't come up yet but we are dealing in this particular passage with predictive history. In other words, he is saying something is going to be happening. So in Isaiah chapter 41, verse 1, it says, Listen to me in silence, O coastlands. So literally, he's talking to us right now. He's saying, Hey, Eastern Shore, listen up. Let peoples renew their strength. Let them approach. Then let them speak. Let us together draw near for judgment. So what we have here in some ways is a legal oracle. This is, this is, God is essentially holding court and he's calling all the people together, all the peoples of the world to be his witness for what he's about to do. He's going, I guess another way to put this would be that God's going on the record with this one. Write this down, he's saying. Pay attention. I'm telling you something that hasn't happened yet that is going to happen and God says, that's something only I can do. Now, that's an interesting concept, which, again, we'll unpack on the next page, which for us is about an hour. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Kevin. I appreciate that. Uh, but God is, is saying something. So he says this, verse 2. Who stirred up the one from the east, whom victory meets at every step? Who stirred up the one from the east, whom victory meets at every step? What we have in this section is God's sovereign control over the nations and Israel is being reinforced. God is saying in these passages, I'm going to prove to you that I'm the one who's actually in charge. And he mentions this one from the east. Now, 
It hasn't happened yet. We'll get to some more dates here in a second. But who he's speaking of is Cyrus the Great of Persia. Next week, we'll go a little bit more into Cyrus the Great because he was so great. Cyrus the Great of Persia, essentially what you have is he's the one that conquers the Babylonians. So right now, everything's under Babylonian pressure. They are under the pressure of the Babylonians. That's what's happening. But he is saying, I, God is speaking through him, saying, even though you are under oppression from the Babylonians, I am actually stirring one up farther east, because Persia is, you know, just, in case you don't know what we're dealing with, just, I should probably throw it out there. Okay. So imagine this, actually this way. This is the Mediterranean Sea. Okay? You have Israel, right? And you have Jordan, Next to Jordan, you have who knows what's next. What's next east? The one with the Q. Iraq. We call it Iraq nowadays, okay? Iraq, that's where Babylon is. Okay, so Syria's up here. Jordan's kind of over here. You have Iraq. Then east of Iraq, those of you who remember, those of you who were alive in the 70s, is Iran. Iran is Persia. So much, in fact, some of you... I'm old enough to remember, like, I'm old enough to be scared to death of the Ayatollah Khomeini. He's the scariest person that has ever lived. Come on. Those of us who have a certain age, he's literally the scariest person. He was on the news. He had the black thing, the sullen face. Come on. Can we be honest? Terrified of him, right? So Iran is where this idea of Persia. So I had, one, I had a good friend when I lived in California. His name was, uh, I, I don't know, I should say his name, but his name was Nason. He was, and he would always say, I'm Persian, I'm Persian. I'm like, well, Persia hasn't been a country for like a thousand years. Like no one's used that. But it was his way of saying, my family is from Iran. He was so like anti irani sentiment, for those of us who remember that, growing up was so intense that Irani Americans would not call themselves Iranian. They would call themselves Persians, in case you've ever wondered. So this is that. Iran is Persia. Iraq is roughly Babylon, and it sort of goes over. So he's saying, hey, Babylon, that's Nebuchadnezzar, all those guys, there is someone from the east farther, and there's an empire. We'll get into their dynamics. It's the Medes and the Persians. They eventually become the Medo-Persian Empire. They're the ones that eventually get in a fight with the Greeks, and you have, and the Spartans, and Alexander the Great beats them, and you have the movie 300, and there you go. And then the Romans. And that's really world history. Uh, that's a little bit of European history right there uh, for you. Uh, first the dinosaurs came. Um, that's an airplane joke. Okay, um, so he says, who stirs that up? And whom victory meets at every step. Does anybody else's translation have something different than victory meets at every step in verse 2? Yes, right here, we have a hand up. What, say it a little bit louder so I can hear you. It'll say something right, offers righteousness to his feet. So it says it calls, and what is that? What translation are you using? New American Standard. Okay. So the translation, for those who couldn't hear, was and calls righteousness to his feet or causes righteousness to come on his feet. So what you have is this idea of righteousness on his feet, but some of your translations are going to say victory at every step. This is an awesome example of demonstrating how translators make decisions for you. Because it only says one thing, right? It's not like the New American Standard people got a hold of a different copy of Hebrew Scripture than the English Standard. By the way, fun fact, they all use the same Hebrew and Greek Scriptures, just, I don't know if people know that. Like any major Bible published or translated, they all use like only three or four original texts. Just thought, I'd, And they're all just sort of going off of that same. It's like the family recipe, but you know, Aunt Linda makes it different than Aunt Deb. And so that's what you have. But we're all using Mimaw's recipe, right? But no one can read Mimaw's handwriting. So you kind of have to translate it. And Aunt Linda says, no, it says cumin. And Aunt Deb says, no, it's sugar. And it makes two really different recipes, right? That's a little bit of what's happening here. Same recipe, but they spin it differently. So what could it be saying? What he's saying is this. Who, one stirred up, who stirred up one from the east, God's asking. Who is stirring up this pagan king whom victory or righteousness walks with? In other words, he's saying this. 
This is a pagan king who is not a follower of me, but because I'm using him, he is the right decision. I am making him right. And the only one who could do that is a sovereign God. It's right because God is the one doing it. It's right because God is the one raising him up. We could look at someone like Cyrus and say, you know, Jews could say, oh, he's horrible. Like, this is horrible. But God, it doesn't matter. When he's in God's, this is how powerful God is. When he's in God's hands, there is a rightness to it. Not, there is not a holiness to it. That's a different word. But the word for victory in my English Standard Bible and the word that's translated righteousness in her New American Standard Bible is the same word. And sometimes in your Bible, it's translated victory, and sometimes it's translated righteousness. What does that mean? It means the, vic- the right outcome. Does that make sense? It's right, not necessarily holy or pure, but it's right because God is the one leading it. So kind of an interesting thing. It is in some ways, another way that you could phrase it is that God is raising up Cyrus to bring a victory for righteousness. This is a win for the good guys even if the good guy, even if it's not a good guy, accomplishing it, right? So that kind of an idea. So that he tramples kings underfoot and makes them like dust with his sword, like, like a driven stubble with his bow. He pursues them and passes on safely by paths his feet have not trod. This is another one. No one really knows how to translate this one. It's completely wonky. What he's saying Some people think it means that um, there's one version of the translation or the interpretation of it that means that he moved so quickly, it's like his feet didn't touch the ground. There's another reference to another king in Daniel where Daniel says that. Like he's so powerful, he's moving so quick, like the German blitzkrieg, right? Just boom, it's shock and awe, boom. He's moving so fast. That's one way. The other way is to look at it as in the ancient world, for those of you who study this kind of thing, in the ancient world, some of your best defenses were the defenses of nature. In other words, you were in a valley and there was a mountain range around you, like an impassable mountain range. There was a river at your boundary. There was a desert on your border. Like, they're just natural defenses. He's so powerful, mountains will flatten. Rivers will dry up. Actually, he's, God is actually using some of the same language that God uses about his own power. And he's saying, the sky I'm raising up will do this. But he's not the important part. The important part is what happens in verse 4. Who has performed and done this? Calling the generations from the beginning. I, the Lord, the first and with the last, I am he. So what we're establishing, what God is establishing is, in humanity, we tend to pay attention to the actors on the stage right? So we put our trust in this leader or that leader, or we put our trust in this policy or that policy or this pastor or that pastor or this celebrity or that, you know, athlete or whatever, right? We like to look at the people and think we're being led by them. God is saying, don't pay attention to the actor because I'm the the playwright. These actors are only doing Even someone as powerful as Cyrus, God is saying, he's only doing what I'm allowing and calling him to do. Because Israel had this problem, again, remember, with trusting mortal kings. They loved mortal kings. You you couldn't get them enough. They didn't have one. They'd go find one. They'd ask for one. They'd raise one up. They'd choose one over the other. All they wanted was someone in front of them to tell them what to do. And God is saying, God is now revisiting this idea of why do you keep asking for someone to help you through these situations when I'm the one raising all these people up to begin with? And at the end of our time together tonight, God or Isaiah or God, whoever whoever inspired this section, tells a joke. And it's comedy of the Old Testament night. So get ready. I should have like a little brick wall and a spotlight behind me, but we'll see. He goes on, coastlands have seen and are afraid. The ends of the earth tremble. They have drawn near 
and come. They have drawn near and come. In other words, they, they get close to each other, and now they're all coming to bow before God. Everyone helps his neighbor and says to his brother, be strong. This is kind of interesting. What God is saying in that, he's saying the point where your gods can't help you, your gods aren't encouraging you anymore, so you have to, like, encourage each other. Now, one of the themes of Isaiah that we've talked about is really God's I mean, there's no other way to say it. God's mocking and complete, undignified, total lack of respect for the gods of, of Babylon, the gods of Assyria. And God constantly just says they're jokes. This is ridiculous. And we, we'll have some of that. But he says this. The craftsman, the craftsman strengthens the goldsmith. And he who smooths with the hammer him who strikes the anvil saying of the soldering, it is good. And they strengthen it with nails so that it cannot be moved. And if you were a Jewish person in the first century, you'd be laughing right now. Because this is, this is great stuff. This is hysterical. We don't know because it doesn't come up. But let me show you something. He says this. This is that verse in Hebrew again. What basically saying is he's saying this. This is haras, uh, which is like sculptor or craftsman, Right? So he says, what's translated craftsman, harass, strengthens the, I want to make sure I get it right, right? So he strengthens the al sapor, the al sapor, something like that, uh, or the, I'm sorry, that's not right, that's a bet, the ab sapor, right? So the goldsmith strengthens the other gold, or the craftsman, the sculptor strengthens the goldsmith, or the one who melts down the gold, right? And that person hands it over to the Malik Patis, which is just a great word, in case you ever want to know what should I name my kid. Right there, Malik Patis, with also goldsmith or artisan. This was the person that, if you're building a statue and you wanted it to be gold, you'd build it out of wood, and then you would gold leaf or hammer gold onto it. That's the Malik Patis, right? And then that person then hands it off to this guy, who is the Holim Palam, or the Holim Pa'am, Holim Pa'am, which is a blacksmith. So what's God saying? God's saying that your God, the one you're putting your trust in, is made by four different people. And he's so weak that when they're finished, they still have to nail it to the ground so it won't fall over. Because again, remember, in Jewish culture, there's nothing more hysterical than a pagan idol falling over. It's a big deal. So he says, look at all these people it takes to make one God. And look how, and so there is this idea, and we're going to develop this through the course of the night. This will be a theme that will keep coming up again and again in the night. If a God has to be made, how can it be a God? And that's really God's logic here. Yahweh's logic is if a God has to be sculpted, if a God has to be formed, if a God, ha and we'll get to another phase of this in a second, but it has to be made, then how can it be a God? You are the ones calling, he says, of the soldering, they say it is good. And he's actually playing a little bit on Genesis right there. Why? Because that's what God said when he created something. So basically what he's saying is pay attention, Israel, and pay attention, all the nations. You are making your gods the same way that I made you. You are calling them good the same way that I called all of creation good. The only one who gets to call a creation good is its creator. So God is laying out this very subtle philosophical logic that basically says, you made your gods. And a God that you made is no God at all. But you, Israel, my servant, verse 8, Jacob I have chosen, the offspring of Abraham my friend. God is, because remember, this is written to them in exile. He is now reinforcing, I've chosen you, you're my people. I love you. I have not rejected you. Which, to be fair, if you're in exile, this is going to be a problem. And God is constantly saying, but I am with you. I am with you. In fact, he says that later on in verse 10. Fear not, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous hand. As much as those other words are in there, look at that repetition. You, 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 yours. And it's singular in the sense of he's speaking to all of Israel as one people. I am with 
all of you now. So he's talking to a whole nation, but using a singular tone. So he's saying you, he's not saying y'all. So you could almost appropriately read this as God, if you were in Israel, and even today, you could read this as God speaking to you directly. And again, I've talked about this before, but that's just one of the tragedies of the English that we use to translate. It's the second person plural, because the second person singular is the word you. Second person plural, we also use the word you. And if they would just listen to us, we would help them, because we have second person plural, and it's y'all. And if there's a lot of them, it's all y'all. Right? By the way, in case you're ever reading King James for kicks, that's the difference between ye and you and thee and thou. Ye and you is the plurals. Thee and thou is singular. But thou, O man, do what is required. That means he's talking to a person. You shall not have any other gods. He's talking to all of them. Anyway, that was free. Okay, he talks about this. Again, verse 13. For I, the Lord your God, hold your right hand. It is I who say to you, fear not. I am the one who helps you. So as we remember that the the reason Israel finds themselves in this predicament of exile and punishment and, and judgment is because of their dependence on other gods. Their denial of what God had told them to do to remain singular and holy to him, particularly through their treating, how they, tra- how they their uh, approach to the poor and to the disenfranchised and then their idolatry, right? So they disobeyed God in regards to that. God is now saying, I know, but you're still mine. Don't worry, you're still mine. It's really a very powerful message. Don't worry, you're still mine. And then he says this cute little verse in verse 14. Fear not, you worm, Jacob. Now, I read that, and I'm like, that's not cool. And then I studied it. And apparently, it wasn't an insult to be called a worm in this way. It's like, hey, little worm. Hey, little guy. Like, it's that kind of a worm. Like, you're small and vulnerable and diminutive. You're limited. Hey, champ. So those of you who have, you know, hey, little buddy. So those of you with sons, the next time, don't say little buddy. Say, hey, little wormy. No, don't do that. Please don't do that. But that's kind of what it was. So it's not like it sounds really horrible, but it's not. By the way, I am not telling you to start calling each other this. I don't want what Pastor Brian said it was okay. How do we know this? Fear not, you worm Jacob, you men of Israel. So Jacob equals Israel, therefore worm equals men. And all the women said, that's right. Okay, all right. I am the one who helps you, declares the Lord, your Redeemer. Now, if you, if you are a note taker in your Bible, like if you have your Bible, you're a highlight or note taker, you're going to want to circle slash underline and or highlight whatever it is you do. Redeemer. This is the first time this word appears in the book of Isaiah. It is in the book of Isaiah 13 times. This is an important word. And the word for Redeemer is this word. Gaal, and it means redeemer. And there it is in the sentence there, Gaal. Now, there were all types of redeemers. Well, that's not true. There were different approaches to redeemers. One was redeemer in the sense of, I am going to redeem something for you. Like that was a positive way. Like, hey, you've been, you lost something. Uh, maybe you fell into debt and you lost, I'm gonna go get it for you. That's a redeemer. In fact, if you read the book of Ruth, this word is used in reference to Boaz. Boaz is the redeemer for Ruth. It's called the kinsman redeemer, right? And he's the redeemer for Ruth because Ruth has lost everything, and Boaz sort of steps up to the plate and redeems her life and her dignity and all that kind of stuff. But it also is a word that's quite violent in the sense of, hey, you wronged your boy, now my, now my backup's here. So as much as it can be redeemer, it can be rescuer, but it can also be avenger. And I just thought that was kind of fun, right? But it's this idea that God is introducing himself now to Israel as someone who will both rescue them out of sin, but also act upon those who have wronged them. 
Okay? So if you remember one of the discussions about both Assyria and Babylon is God would say, yes, Assyria, I am going to use you to judge my people. And then Assyria, I'm going to use Babylon to judge you because you're horrible. And then Babylon, he would say, yes, Babylon, I'm going to use you to judge my people. And then I'm going to use Persia to judge you. And then Persia, yes, Persia, you're actually okay to my people. Sorry, but the Greeks, they got their eye on. I'm not going to get involved. And then the Greeks and then the Romans and then, the, yeah, and then you get it from there, right? So it just goes on and on. So God is saying, but what I'm going to do is I am going to make up the gap. And, and look at the connection, though. It's your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. So what he's doing is he's drawing a direct line between this new character on the scene called the Redeemer, and he's saying, it's me. This is critical because it starts to justify, it lays the, the primitive groundwork for the fact that Jesus is God. Because when Jesus steps into the mantle of Redeemer, when he starts using these verses about himself, he is claiming that he is God. Oftentimes there's this thing called the quest for the historical Jesus, and maybe you've seen it, or you saw the Da Vinci Code, or you watch too much History Channel. And they always say, one of the things they always say is, well, you know, Jesus never really claimed to be God. That was something his followers did afterward. They turned him into God. My thing has always been, well, if he didn't claim to be God, why'd they kill him? Because up until that point, he's just like, hey, we should be sweet. Like, that was his whole stick, right? Jesus, in using these terms and these verses later on, makes it very clear Jesus sees himself as God. And it makes it extraordinarily clear that his earliest followers considered him to be God. These were not verses that you just threw on a nice guy. Okay? Because right there it is. The Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. This formula is typically always, up until this point, the formula has always been Yahweh, the Holy One of Israel. And so there can be, you can make no mistake about this. Jumping down to verse 17, when the poor and the needy seek water and there is none, and their tongue is parched with thirst, the poor and the needy are sort of shorthand code for just the desolate and the powerless in general. So God is saying both spiritually and literally, it's not one or the other, of the powerlessness. It's very easy. Some traditions, when they read this, they'll say, no, he's only talking about the socioeconomic powerlessness of people, and that becomes our biggest priority. It's a huge priority, but it's not our only priority. And then some traditions will say, no, no, no. Whenever God talks about being poor and needy, God doesn't care about money or anything like that. He's saying it's their spiritual life. It's their spiritual life. We should only pay attention to that. And that's a false dichotomy that doesn't bear out in Scripture. It's constantly the poor and the needy, both socioeconomically, and it's both and. It's not either or. And the spiritually hungry and needy. He said, I, the Lord, will answer them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. And then this is interesting. In verse 19, he says something kind of cool. So they're in exile. This is just drawing a little line for you. I'm going to take a breath in case you want to write something down real quick. Because I saw somebody's notes, and they're like, my hand hurts because you go so fast. So I'm just going to slow down. Um, this is kind of a cool verse. He says, in the wilderness, you can circle that. Wilderness is exile, so in Babylon. Look what he says. He says, I will put in the wilderness, and he says, seven trees. And I know people are like, oh, seven. Why does he name seven trees? Because there were seven. Sorry, I, I, yeah, anyway. All right. He said, I will put in the wilderness the cedar, the acacia, the myrtle, and the olive. Right? I will set in the desert the cypress, the plain, and the pine together. Seven trees. What's interesting is the, these are trees where all seven of them are only in Syria and Israel at the time. Some of these trees were in Babylon, but to get all seven of them, you needed to be in either Syria or Israel, which is geographically and sort of uh, botanically the same place. So what is God saying? In the wilderness... It's not a stretch. He's saying, I can make exile feel like home. I care about you so much. And I am so, and I am so involved in not only 
your well-being, but just your, your everything, not just in your safety, but your well-being. And that, by the way, is the concept of shalom. Your entire well-being, I am so invested in your entire well-being, I will, I will make your exile look like home, feel like home, okay? That they may see and know, that they may consider and understand together that the hand of the Lord, that the hand of Yahweh has done this, the Holy One of Israel. So what is he doing there? He just talked about the Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Then he talks about Yahweh, the Holy One of Israel. So what has he done? He's tied Redeemer and Yahweh together. Okay? All right. So moving on, uh, idols, you don't need to be feared because idols are dumb. Um, Let's get to 25, chapter 41, verse 25. Then he says this. So he said, I stirred up from the east. And then he says, I stirred up from the north. Right? Oh, we'll get there in a second. I stirred up from the east. And then I said, I stirred up from the north. And he has come from the rising of the sun. He shall call upon my name. So you say the north and the east. Well, the Babylonian empire was so huge. Or the Persian empire, rather, was so huge that he could come from the north or the east. And he would be coming from there. This is what's interesting. This doesn't happen till about 545 BC is when Cyrus finally conquers um, or Cyrus defeats Babylon. Conservatively, Isaiah is saying these statements in 780 BC. So there's about a 160 year gap. Why is this critical? Verse 26, who declared it from the beginning that we might know and beforehand that we might say he is right. There was none who declared it, none who proclaimed it, none who heard your words. So he's saying, when you read this later and these events come to pass, who told you it was going to happen? That's really wild. God is writing in here his own proof of his power. When this guy comes from the north or the east and he brings about your salvation by releasing you from exile, go back and read this and right here you'll get to this line and that question will be there. Who told you this was going to happen? Who told you this was going to happen? Who said it from the beginning? 27, I was the first to say to Zion, behold, there they are and I give to Jerusalem a herald of good news. God says, when you ask yourself that question, who was it? God says, I was the first. Before history happened, I'm telling you what's going to happen. Okay, let's get philosophical. You ready? Here we go. Okay. In the ancient world, time, fun I know, right? You need to play the Doctor Who theme, okay? So in the ancient world, time was a circle. Okay, so it was always uh, birth, death, rebirth, death. Like it was just this big thing. You can read mythologies and, oh, where did, where did, like, okay, let's take the Greek gods. Where did the Greek gods? Well, they were gods before them, right? And how did the Greek gods become gods? They killed the gods before them. Well, how did those gods get to become gods? They, you know, they took over somebody for them. Uh, the Norse gods, which, you know, we all love Thor, right? Who doesn't? Um, their whole thing, their whole end of the world is literally the beginning of a new world. So it's all about, re so it's all cyclical. In other words, they had confidence in their gods because everything that's happened has happened before and it's basically going to happen again. The Norse were really into it. They're like, it's all fixed in destiny. I don't even have to be afraid to die because I'm going to die whenever I'm going to die. So I might as well go out there and slap around those weird Englishmen with my shield. Like that's, that's how they were into it. Every, nearly every religion in the ancient world saw this as a cycle, but they saw all, this is critical, they saw all of creation as a cycle. In other words, the gods were just as bound to this cycle as the rest of the created world because the gods were part of creation. Okay? Everyone with me so far? I'm just assuming in Baymanet and online, you're doing great. Okay? I would say, based on the eyes in the room here, 
about 60, 40. Um, but we're doing okay. So we have this cycle. And so you go in here, and then it would start over. And you can find this everywhere, by the way. You don't have to, like, look around. One of the funniest things in the world is the Romans, right? The Romans are like, well, we, we deserve to be the world power. Why? Oh, because we're the descendants of the Spartans who were Greeks. So the reason you get to be Romans is because you're Greek. Like, but what did they need to do? They had to rely on the power of a previous strength, right? And the Greeks relied on the fact, well, we beat the other guy. And so there's this cycle of just going through the same thing over and over and over again, okay? But one religion said this, our God is not a part of the cycle. Our God is outside of it. Because in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God is not in the cycle. God started the cycle. He's over the cycle. Okay? The word, if you're wanting to write words down, is God is, God in this sense is literally transcendent. He is outside all of it. And the reason that he can speak into and dictate these massive future events is because he's not bound to the rules that everyone else is. And so he says, I want to instill in Cyrus a desire to free my people. Do I can do that. The Jewish people were the first one to label their God as entirely other. Okay? He's not a part of creation at all. Even the Greeks, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Medes, the Persians, the Medo-Persians, the Middle Medo-Persians, the New Kingdom, the Old Kingdom, the Middle Kingdom, the Egyptian, the Canaanites, the Jebusites, the Saracites, the Parasites, the, you know, all of them, right? They all said, where did your God come from? Oh, well, he popped out of that hill. There was a war, and they ripped an alligator's body open, and the blood poured out, and that became, like, it's all connected. They would ask the Jews, where did your God come from? Nowhere. He's just here. And they're like, that makes no sense. In fact, in the Roman world, they thought Christians were atheists because they never had a God to point to. And they're like, you don't have gods. And like, well, you have one God. And they're like, yeah, but, oh, you mean Caesar? And they're like, no. <laughs> Quote Captain America, I'm pretty sure there's only one God and he doesn't dress like that. So why is this important? God is laying a foundation that he hopes his people will never, ever, ever fall back into the same trap because we are all bound by the same trap. We are all, every single one of us, from them in the 8th century BC to us right here in the 21st century AD, we are all tempted to worship what we can see, what we can experience. We all are. We will even take Christian things and turn them into tangible, idly type things just so we can have something to worship. You're like, no, 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 no. I'm Protestant and evangelical. I don't do such things. Really? Do you clamor to hear from your favorite pastor? Do you say, oh, I need to have such and such pray for me? Oh, I've got to, you know, i got to make sure that we are all built to put someone between us and him. And God is going to hit this theme over and over and over again because that's the mistake. The mistake, again, it's really fascinating. We said this a couple weeks ago, and I don't know if it landed, but God is never attacking the strength of these armies because they're irrelevant to him. What is he attacking? The idolatry of their kingdoms. God is saying the strength of their army, look, I can use that. I, in fact, I will use the strength of their armies to liberate you or to judge you. That's all under me. But God knows the most dangerous thing is not the strength of the enemy, but the ideas of the enemy. Because that's what we'll fall for. We will assume that the values and the ideas of the enemy's plans, of the successful prominence in our lives, that works, so we should do it. 
And so our battle, as Paul would say from this point, centuries later, he would say our weapons, Paul says it later, he says our weapons aren't against flesh and blood, but principalities, the way you think. And powers, there is this other battle going on. So that means that this flesh and blood stuff, we should neither war against it nor worship it. Because this is not our fight and these are not our enemies. We'll get to that in a second. What he's saying is God is saying, I don't, I don't know where this, God would say this, I'm not worried about the physical strength of Babylon. God would say, I'm not worried about the physical strength of Egypt. Well, at this time, no one was worried about the physical strength of Egypt. And they're like a bent reed that'll, I love that, that'll break off when you lean on it and then stab you in the hand. I just, that's so, that's, that's funny. This killed in the 8th century, I'm telling you. Um, I'm not worried about Egypt. I'm not worried about, I'm not worried about, what I'm worried about, God would say, is that you start thinking like Assyrians. I'm not worried that you're scared of the Babylonians. I'm actually worried that you'll like the way Babylonians live. That's what God is fighting against. Because why? They're all in here. From Zeus to Marduk to Moloch to Dagon to Thor to whomever. They're all in the Shiva, Vishnu. They are all in the bubble. And we're more likely to grab onto something that we can see than God who is outside. And yet God is the one who put... So what is God saying? Because God is the only one outside the cycle, he's the only one who can break the cycle. Because the cycle's been the same since day one. Death, judgment, and that's what it's been. You, you, you sin, you get punished, then you die. That's life. And that's the cycle. Every religion had the same cycle. The idea that anyone would step in, any God would step in and clean up the mess, you, that's, that's literally nowhere. And so he's saying, but there is a redeemer, he says. I will give you an earthly concept of this by creating a legal code by which if someone needs to stand in for your debt, you call a Gael or, Gael, or a Goel, however you want to put it. Some people translate it differently, and they can step in and they can take your debt. If someone, if you can't afford the punishment, someone else can step in and take your punishment. In fact, if the sin is so grievous you could die, here's what you can do. You can actually transfer your sin onto this animal and we'll just kill the animal. Because God set in motion, someone can stand in for you. And someone will stand up for you. And he embedded it into the earliest forms of humanity. Think about this. In the garden, they sin. And what do they do? Fig leaves. Right? They grab whatever they can find and they cover up. Because they were naked and ashamed. And let me tell you something. I'm so glad to be back in the South. Because I say naked. I don't say naked. And as Jeff Foxworthy said, naked, N-A-K-E-D, is when you don't have any clothes on. Naked, N-E-K-K-E-D, is when you don't have any clothes on and you're up to something. Those are the difference, right? <laughs> so they were naked and ashamed. But what does God do? They, they, they try to just make something up. They grab the leaves. God is the one, think about this. God is the one who kills an animal and skins it to cover them up. God covers their shame with the death of another. God himself, sit, imagine that, God sitting in the garden dressing a deer. God has always said, you don't have to die for this. And yet, we constantly choose the gods who demand death from us. So God finally is saying, that's not how it's going to work. And he says this in chapter, look, it says, verse 29, behold, they are all a delusion. Their works are nothing. Their mental images are empty wind. It's those three. If you look at your notes from last week, it's the same three words, the empty wind, the uh, desolation, the, all that kind of stuff. He says it again. 
This is also an interesting concept. With 15 minutes, we won't worry about it. Okay, all right. Chapter 42, verse 1. Behold my servant whom I am uphold. This is the first of what are called the suffering servant passages. This is a huge theme in these next several chapters. I, will put, I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. Okay? This passage contains the first of the servant songs for telling the arrival of the one who will save Israel. I'm trying to do better with the blanks because I know I was stressing some people out. Okay, all right. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. If you compare this to like 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 17, compare it to 2 Samuel chapter 3, verse 18, it's 1 Samuel 9, 17, or 2 Samuel 3, 18, it sounds like a kingly commission is what's happening. It's sort of the same language. It's similar to the language that God actually called Abraham with, that God commissioned Moses with. Like God is basically commissioning this servant, Okay. And it says, he will bring forth justice to the nations. Okay. Typically, justice, bringing forth justice, was done, you know, through violence. But listen to what it says he will. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. So God is saying the cycle to bring about justice has always been strength. But you're already beaten and bruised. I will not solve oppression with more oppression. When this servant comes, he brings justice gently. He brings justice kindly. He brings justice in a loving way. A bruised reed he will not break. If there's not a better metaphor for like being afraid of giving your heart back to God, that's, that's so vivid. God, I feel like a bruised reed. And if I come into that church and I hear one more thing about sin or my failure or backsliding or one joke, or I'm going to snap. And God says, I don't do that a faintly flickering little candle, I'm not going to blow out a little flame that's struggling. This is what he says. He will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice and the coastlands wait for his law. Okay. The servant is someone that God is sending. Following me? But the servant will establish justice, which only God can do, and everyone will follow his law or teaching, Torah, his law or teaching, which only God can do. So even in here, we have embedded the idea that this servant will somehow be as God, connected to God, with God. The deity of the servant is embedded very subtly even in these prophetic passages. And people say, oh, that's because they jammed it in later. These are all pre-Jesus. I'm talking they went to print before Jesus. So they don't have Jesus' claims in mind when they're writing this. This is embedded in there. I am the Lord. Thus Thus says the God, the Lord, does all this stuff. He says this, I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness I will take you by the hand and keep you. He's talking now of the servant. Why? Because the servant will be in jeopardy. And he says, so now this passage is speaking to whomever this servant is. I will keep you. Okay? I will take you by the hand. And it's singular, by the way. So he's speaking to a person. And then he says, and I will give you as a covenant for the people. So the future servant that God is speaking to here, he's saying, you will be the covenant between me and my people now. He is describing the mission of Jesus. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words, God says, will never pass away. 
Today I have fulfilled this in your hearing. He's quoting Isaiah when he does that. So these verses are setting up this. Why? This is what's awesome. I'm not just going to tell you to do it, but why? To open the eyes that are blind. And listen to this. This is how God sees the darkness and sin of the world. To bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prisons, those who sit in darkness. This is interesting because God's language towards sinners is shifting. It's no longer enemy. It's you're a prisoner and I'm coming to set you free. And I want us to think about that. God is saying this entire existence is a prison and I'm coming to set you free. Why? Because you are not meant to live in darkness. You're not meant to live this way. So I'm going to set you free. We tend to think of the world as a battlefield with the good guys and the bad guys. And we're at war. We have culture wars. Uh, we have, um, you know, we have culture wars. We have religious wars. We have the war on Christmas. There's like all kinds of wars, right? Battle bots. There's wars everywhere, okay? So we think of everything in terms of conflict. God says, it's not, you guys aren't all enemies. You're all just prison, prisoners, in the same prison. C.S. Lewis adopted this later. Many of you have heard me talk about this. But this reflection of, I can't think of my fellow man anymore as my enemy. They're a fellow prisoner. And some of them side with the guards, to be fair. But that doesn't make them any less a prisoner than I am. So then we're thinking, oh, Jesus is going to come and like break us out, like the great escape. It's going to be awesome. And he's going to be like Steve McQueen on a motorcycle. It's going to be sick. No, he's not. Jesus is not Steve McQueen on a motorcycle. Um, according to C.S. Lewis, I love this. He let himself get captured. And he showed us the way out from the inside. But this idea that opening eyes that are blind, it is really saying now everyone who's in this situation has been put upon by the oppressive spiritual powers of this world. And I think this is valuable for us in the modern age. Why? Because you guys know I'm kind of a soft-hearted hippie anyway, so don't get shocked about what's about to come out of my mouth. But I think we spend a lot of time as Christians looking at our enemies and not realizing that some of the people we say are enemies are just as bound and blind as we were. And they're in the joint with us. Now, we may have a scrap in the yard. I'm pushing the metaphor. But you understand that. They are in some ways, I don't want to use the word victim because I know that will challenge you, but they are as bound to the cycle as we were, and we luckily found the way out. And they're not our enemy, they're just another prisoner who hasn't found their way out of the cycle yet. He says this, I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory I give to no other. So he's talking about the servant that he's going to send and everything that that servant's going to accomplish. But then he says, I'm God and I don't give my glory to anyone else. So you see how he's tying himself and the servant person together. And then he says this, Behold, the former things have come to pass and new things I now declare. Before they spring forth, I'll tell you of them. This is the introduction of the concept of new things. Now, why does this matter? The cycle, there are no new things in the cycle. Even, the, even Solomon, if he's the one that wrote Ecclesiastes, he bemoans this. What does he say? He says, there's nothing new under the sun, right? Time is a flat circle. Like, however you want to say it, we're back here again. We're going through the cycle. We're going, all of a sudden, God said, there's a cycle, but behold, I am doing, I'm going to break this cycle. The pagan gods couldn't break the cycle. Why? Because they're a part of it. Only the one outside of the cycle can break the cycle. Does that make sense? By the way, we all have our cycles in our life. You're like, oh, this is really esoteric. No, there's ways you think right now, and everybody around you thinks the same way, and then someone comes along and says, hey, have you thought about this? And you're like, you're a crazy person. Well, how do you know I'm a crazy person? Because everybody agrees with me. Yes, everyone you like and know agrees with you. <laughs> I'm going to end right here. We are not finished, but I'm going to end right here because of time. 
Just want you to think about this in closing. If you're stuck in the cycle, all you know is the cycle, right? So think of right now your pets. Your pets are, are stuck in a cycle. They get up, you let them out, hopefully. They come back in. Maybe you feed them if you're in the mood. All they know is that that other thing basically does the same thing every day. But the only reason they know that there's another thing is because you interact with them. Okay, so your dog's like, hey, uh, uh, big dog with the, with, with the beard, he's the one that walks me, and uh, other dog with the curly hair, she's the one that feeds me. That's all our dogs know. Big dog with the beard, he's the one that pushes me away when I try to come up on the couch, and curly-headed dog, she hugs me. Like, that's all, that's all they know. They think we're the same as them, just bigger. How could they conceive? They can't conceive of another thing, okay? Because they're in the cycle. So the only way that they ever learn of another thing is if the other thing introduces themselves. In other words, comes outside their cycle. So if we take that up and scale it up to us, because we're super smart, we have opposable thumbs, like we're geniuses. We can use tools, all kinds of stuff, right? Even though technically otters and beavers use tools, so it's not that impressive. But that's, that's neither here nor there, right? And raccoons with their creepy hands, or, okay, whatever. But we have, and we have our frontal lobe, and we have all these things that make us different. But the truth is, is that whenever we make something, when we create something, it's always something that just extends our cycle a little bit more. In other words, how could we have ever, con anyone ever conceived of an entirely other thing? Every other religion in the world conceived of the same type of divine structure. Created gods that lived in the local hills and made everything happen. One group of people, one group of people in all of human history came up with a transcendent God that was outside the cycle. To me, and this is what the commentator showed, to me that says the only way you can see that is if the transcendent God came into the cycle. We couldn't have thought this up on our own. How do I know there's a God? Because I can think of a God. Because honestly, we're not that smart. When left to our own, we, we worship stuff that we make. But to come up with a God that has no body, that cannot be worshipped in, in one specific place, that does all these kinds of stuff, that is so completely other than us, there's this, forgive me, this existential need, right, for this intentionally transcendent being who is transcendent, yes, but yet invades, invades. And he reveals himself to a group of people and those group of people begin to tell the story and then he invades again and he sets those people free and he starts moving the pieces around in a, in a logic that only he can comprehend. And then finally, when it comes to, as Paul says, at the right time, he steps in again and Christ died for the ungodly. And here's the other thing. Our faith doesn't cycle back. Our faith is a beginning and an end. There's no loop. Some of you are like, I kind of feel like I'm in a loop every day. Look, that's a you problem. We just need to pray you through it. I'm talking on a global cosmic scale. We know. Christianity, Judaism was the one that says, up, nope, there's a beginning to time and an end to time. This cycle will end, and then there's something on the other side of that, but it's not another cycle. We couldn't have thought of that unless something outside the cycle stepped into our lives and revealed that to us. Let's pray. God, thank you for who you are, what you do in our lives. God, I pray uh, that you would heal all the headaches I just gave everyone. Um, and Father, just speak to us each now as we go into our discussion time. In Jesus' name, amen. So, chew on that.